is it possible to bring about significant change in an established church without splitting it into pieces? Today, I'm going to be talking about appreciative inquiry, which is a method I've used to bring about renewal in several of the congregations where I've been blessed to work. I've been making blog posts for several uh, weeks now about appreciative inquiry as a method. Uh, specifically, I've been exploring some of the different assumptions of appreciative inquiry. As I've encountered this study method, uh, I've encountered 10 primary assumptions that are generally associated with it. And you're welcome to look at my blog to see how I've kind of fleshed those out a little bit in study. But what I wanted to do today specifically was to talk about my experiences at the Old Hickory Church of Christ and how I was able to implement some positive changes there uh, in a way that was very well received. So to give you a little bit of uh, context on Old Hickory, uh, the Old Hickory Church of Christ uh, has a long history. I guess it's coming up on around its 100th uh, anniversary here in the next few years. But uh, Old Hickory was established in a DuPont company town uh, because it does have a long history there in the community. There were some members there whose parents had been elders who had lived there their entire lives up into their 80s, even 90s. And so uh, there are people there with a long dedication to that congregation. But also going on in the context, uh, the community was shifting, uh, whereas Old Hickory was predominantly Caucasian, uh, middle class to upper middle class. Uh, there were parts of the neighborhood that were staying pretty nice. There were parts of the neighborhood that had been going uh, downhill uh, as things went. Along with this, the churches in the community were going through several different changes, uh, particularly the congregations around us have been having some of the, the different worship wars that were going on a lot in the early 2000s about different practices in worship and how people felt about them. And so Old Hickory, just like many of the congregations around us, were affected by kind of reshuffling the card deck, so to speak, where people would move from one congregation to another congregation, uh, kind of looking for specific things and what they were wanting to get out of the experience. So at the prospect of making a significant change at Old Hickory, um, you had kind of the, the double issues of people who had just been there a really long time uh, who might have some resistance to change, but then also several people who were newer who were there specifically because of change that had occurred at their previous congregation. So they were tired of uh, going to church and doing battle. They just wanted to show up to a peaceful place and uh, have that experience. Uh, but just the same, as a congregation, Old Hickory was struggling with how to connect to a younger demographic. And while I don't know that we completely solved it, uh, using appreciative inquiry, I was able to make some positive progress uh, that has helped them uh, to address that need. So, um, again, assuming that you'll have a chance to look through uh, some of the blog posts about appreciative inquiry, uh, appreciative inquiry is fundamentally a method of asking questions. Um, most of the research that I did in that context, I did with one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I'd show up with a little questionnaire page, I'd sit down with a couple, and I would just ask them their perspectives and questions on things. Uh, you could also do this with a group at a time. You could do little focus groups with one person asking questions to several others. And uh, if you train lots of people to help you, if you could mission several people to go out and use these questions from appreciative inquiry, uh, you could gather information from a lot of people then have conversations to look for uh, overlap and similarities in some of the answers uh, that you're hearing. But thinking about some of the uh, assumptions of appreciative inquiry, you do assume that what you focus on becomes your reality. You assume that there are some good things that exist about every church, every organization, every family. There are some good things that we could build on. And if we're going to bring parts of the past with us into the future, ideally we want those parts to be the best parts of the past. And so what I was up against was a congregation who had a deep sense of its own history. And back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, Old Hickory had 900 members. Now, at the time I was doing my research, we were sitting at around 300 members, but uh, many people could remember the so-called so glory days uh, when we had, you know, eight, 900 people who were showing up regularly on Sundays, uh, you know, a robust Bible class program, uh, very talented, powerful speakers. And this was just at a time period that you didn't see churches grow to 900 members. It was you know, very uncommon then. It's become more common now. And so what I decided I was going to have to do uh, in order to find a way forward to try and 
figure out what needed to happen. I spent several years at Old Hickory just trying to imagine what it is that would need to change. Now, a lot of times I would you know, put some thought into worship services. You know, Could we do something with the worship services to kind of spice them up a little bit or shift or more of an emphasis on singing or aesthetics or you know, what, what could we do to create kind of a different worship environment, which I assumed was going to be the solution. But then I started using this method, appreciative inquiry, and I went and I started conducting interviews. And I thought, of all the people most likely to resist change, it's probably going to be the people who have the longest history here. So I went and conducted interviews specifically with members that I knew had been there for at least 50 or 60 years who could remember the glory days, who had been there, who had been in Bible class, who had taught Bible class, who had been around for a really long time and could remember what all those days were like. Uh, because so often we were kind of tyrannized by these uh, wonderful memories of the past. You know, everyone could remember back when things were this way and it was so much easier and the church was just kind of uh, booming and blossoming. And so I would go to people's houses and I would start asking them these questions specifically about the glory days. Like, what was it that made the glory days be the glory days? What was it that made those experiences so positive? And I asked about a variety of aspects. And again, I was assuming it must have been what made us so big was that we had some kind of a high-powered uh, preaching minister or some kind of robust worship experience. But what really surprised me once I started asking questions and listening to these longtime members, when they spoke of the greatest parts of the past, in their mind, their best experiences and memories, some of what really inspired them to stay true to the church and to become Christian leaders, they kept mentioning the Bible class program over and over and over. They would talk about the Bible classes, how well prepared the teachers were, how serious the teachers were about getting the privilege of teaching. They talked about all the training that went involved so that teachers would be able to do an excellent job. And beyond this, uh, some of the better experiences they talked about were the way that elders and preachers and leaders would just periodically pop into the Bible classes and walk around the room and just engage the kids. Hey, I think one day you're going to grow up and be a minister, or one day I think you're going to grow up and teach Bible class, or you're going to go be a missionary. And they would just fill the kids' heads with all these wonderful ideas of things that could happen. And so as I started working through this process of, of appreciative inquiry, it was clear to me that if there was anything that they b believed really made the glory days be the glory days, it had something to do with the Bible classes. And so as I'm trying to figure out what is it that I can change that an older generation is going to be really receptive to, I began to fixate on Bible classes as the best possibility. I was, at the time, the youth and education minister. Uh, education was something that I could feasibly make a change in that was kind of under my, you know, under my control. And so I began doing lots of research on kind of the best methods for how to do children's Bible classes. We ended up putting together a program called Faith Village. Uh, I based it largely off of some work that had been done at uh, other congregations. Uh, in particular, we got started uh, with the North Boulevard Church of Christ in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, uh, there's a, a phenomenal kids program that they have going over there. And so we ended up going with kind of a rotation-based format. But what was important was I needed to implement this program. And when I implemented it, I wanted to have as much support as possible. I, I wanted to try and create a lot of consensus. So once I was informed and empowered by this information of what it was the older generation had valued, I had figured out a way I could communicate about this program that they would actually get behind. So I did some stuff behind the scenes with the elders and the other ministers and you know, trying to sort out what it was that I was wanting for the program. But what really made it work, I was able to make an announcement one Sunday morning and the way that I started pitching what was going to be a very different, innovative kind of kids program, the way that I pitched it was as a return to the past. So I started off with black and white photos of their Bible classes back during the time of the glory days. We talked about the way that Bible class is something that had always been one of our core values. It was one of our most uh, important things that we valued, that was important to us, that as we move into the future, we want to continue being a church that values our children's Bible classes. And so I was able to really speak into the values that I knew uh, would resonate at a deep level uh, with the long-term members. Now, as I progressed, again, the Bible classes that we implemented, I'm sure, are nothing like 
any of the stuff that they had done in the past. Uh, it was a very innovative program, but by intentionally couching it in a way that was aligned with the best parts of who we used to be, they were much more open to moving into the future and to changing something when it meant they got to bring with them, as they saw it, a part of the past into the future. And so uh, I had this summer in 2014 where we were working on implementing Faith Village. It involved physical renovations. Uh, we had a lot of fun building um, anticipation around the program. So um, Old Hickory, because it had been so large, we had an abundance of extra classrooms that weren't getting used. So one Sunday, we kicked all the kids out of the children's wings. We put up big signs that said, no kids allowed. Nobody can come up here until the launch date. And so we went into an intense period of, of doing some renovations. But as we move into that phase, uh, I made an effort to keep all steps in this process collaborative, which is one of the other things uh, that Appreciative Inquiry encourages you to do. So I called for a meeting in this announcement where I just said, anyone at all who wants to get involved in Faith Village gets to be involved in Faith Village somehow. If you say you want to get in, the answer is yes. I may not know how yet, but you get to be involved. And so we came up with this robust list of jobs and we went from having, it was like six or eight people involved in the Sunday school program to something more like 25 or 30. I mean, it was, it was a massive shift, but it was great because so many people were interested in getting involved and they all really did want to do a better job at connecting with the younger generation. And so we went through the process that summer of renovating and we launched the program. But around this time, part of what makes this story significant to me is that during this time, this is when I personally transitioned from Old Hickory to the King's Crossing Church of Christ, where I'm now the preaching minister. So even as I was implementing this program, I was aware that it was going to have to run without me. And so I had people involved at every level helping to construct it, helping to imagine what the curriculum needed to look like, what the order of the classrooms and the rotations needed to look like. And so there was a high level of ownership from the congregation and bringing this thing into existence. And so I made my transition. We had gotten Faith Village up and going and it had been maybe a month. And then I moved down to Corpus Christi, Texas. And at that point, you know, I wished them well, but I was out of the picture and it was kind of up to them to take that vision and to carry it. But the great thing is because of how much they had really owned that vision, they did exactly that. And so a couple of individuals in particular uh, had told me about some connections they had to the local schools, uh, because as I mentioned, some parts of the community had gone downhill. You had a lot of kids who struggled with getting enough clothing, with getting uh, food to eat. And so what they did was they took this awesome kids program that we designed together, and then they launched this program that they called Break Night, where on Wednesday nights, at least during the school year, uh, they would bring kids in. It, it developed into really kind of an old school style bus ministry. They would drive around the community in the church bus and with the permission slips and all, they would, they would pick up children. They'd bring them to the church building on Wednesday nights. They would feed them a meal. They would help them a little with homework if that was needed, but they would go to Bible class, get a high quality Bible lesson in this great interactive environment that we'd created, and then they'd send them home. But what was such a wonderful experience for me was even as I was out of the picture and I had nothing to do with the creation or implementation of the break night program, but it was really that program that made this you know, bigger Faith Village program start to function at a higher, more missional level. And so I started getting text messages every Wednesday night from people who wanted to keep me in the loop. Hey, with the break night program this week, we had 15 kids. Hey, this week we had 30 kids. We had 60 kids tonight, Wednesday night, at our church in the Faith Village program. And uh, for, for a couple of months, I kept getting these text messages all the time. I was so encouraged by it. But again, this is not something that I did. This is something that the church did and that they carried forward, uh, they carried forward with them once we helped kind of get those things into place. And so, again, I, I'm pointing to appreciative inquiry as the method that really helped me with this. Because on the front end, it enabled me to, to learn how to ask the right questions from the older generation, those who were more resistant to change. Uh, you know, we're going to have to change something, but whatever it is we bring forward with us into the future, let's make that be the best parts of who we are. You know, let's capture the best parts of our history and bring those with us in some new and innovative way. But uh, to their credit, the church really got behind it. And uh, at this point, you know, it's still a work in progress. And I know there's always bumps along the way as you figure out 
how to do things logistically. Uh, you know, ministry is messy, uh, especially when you're working with unchurched people. But I would give Old Hickory a lot of credit for the way that they uh, you know, took a program that was a good tool that I tried to help them develop. And they really grew it into a powerful community focused ministry where they're reaching people who do not know Christ and are making a, a wonderful difference with it. But again, it started with listening well to what kind of change they would be receptive to and then trying to custom design something that I knew I could sell in line with their history and who it was that they'd been. So uh, it was a great journey, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I would absolutely invite you to read some of my other blog posts about the assumptions of appreciative inquiry and uh, how it works and some different components of it. And as always, would invite you to subscribe here to our YouTube channel or uh, to the blog at kingdomupgrowth.com.